uh, people are still trickling in a little bit, but let's uh, let's get started, huh? Okay, so thanks for coming and for that uh, uh, fluid seminar uh, outside the usual time slot on Friday. So it's a special pleasure to have uh, Chi Chi Wang today. Uh, Chi Chi is an associate professor at uh, MIT in the Aero Department. And uh, he got his PhD at uh, Stanford as one of the first graduates of the then newly established Institute for Computational Mathematics and Engineering. And uh, Chi Chi is an expert in dynamical systems and fluid mechanics and uh, scientific computing and the uh, and, uh, large scale. And uh, he's gonna talk today about computational modeling and the real world, can a butterfly change the climate? So please Chi Chi, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the very nice introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about a topic uh, that uh, actually touches a, a lot of the field. As long as you uh, use computational modeling, uh, I think it's uh, going to be relevant. Uh, I'm particularly going to be talking about chaotic dynamical systems. And uh, uh, the question I'm asking is, can a butterfly change the climate? So let me start with uh, why we are talking about the butterfly here. So the butterfly effect uh, has been a well-known effect for many decades. And uh, the traditional notion of the butterfly effect, which is different from what I'm gonna be talking about today is the following. So the traditional butterfly effect, it says that if you take a chaotic system and you make a small perturbation of the initial condition, then the evolution of the system is gonna be dramatically changed after a while. So this is uh, actually a weather and climate simulation. And uh, we are displaying the sea level pressure difference between two simulations, one just uh, very slightly perturbed. So if you look at after four days and uh, the scale here, 60 Pascals difference. And if you look after 15 days, the scale here becomes 600 Pascals. And if you look at a month later, the difference becomes thousands of Pascals. So, so this is the traditional notion of butterfly effect, right? So if you make a small perturbation, the simulations or the dynamical systems uh, become very different after a while. However, today I'm gonna be uh, talking about something different. Instead of uh, the traditional question, can a butterfly in Brazil cause a tornado in Texas, right? That was the question posed by Edward Lorenz in the 1970s. Today I'm asking, can a butterfly change or control the climate? So what do I mean by climate? If you look at uh, uh, this animation, it is uh, the precipitation, uh, 10 minute by 10 minute precipitation captured by radar in the United States. Okay, so imagine taking this animation, taking this evolving dynamical system of the weather and average it, not over a month, not even over a year, but over three decades. This is what you get. Okay, this is the average the annual precipitation over three decades. So this is the kind of thing I mean by climate. That is long time average or statistics of the weather over a long time. Let's put it in mathematics. This is what I mean by climate. You take a uh, the state of the dynamical system I use as U and uh, a certain function of the state, JU. For example, the precipitation at a certain location, right? That's JU. Now you integrate it over time and divide it by the length of the integration. That's a time average, right? This is averaging the precipitation or certain uh, function over a long time. And then you take the length of the average into infinity. That's a rigorous definition of what I mean by the climate or statistic of a dynamical system. The question I'm asking is, can the butterfly change the statistic or can a small perturbation to the dynamical system change the long time dynamics, long time average dynamics like the climate. All right, so obviously this is a very different question from the uh, Lorenz's question in the 1970s, right? And uh, it is quite uncertain if the answer to this question is yes or no. 
And today I'm going to fully explore this uh, question and uh, argue from all fronts. So the answer to this question is not just interesting mathematically, but has a lot of uh, uh, practical implication. For example, this morning, nearly 130 Boeing 777s worldwide grounded. Mayday, mayday. After terrifying moments in the air Saturday when a United flight leaving Denver for Hawaii was forced to make an emergency landing. Aircraft uh, just experienced a engine failure, need to turn immediately. The plane's right engine failed mid flight, bursting into flames. All of a sudden, it was just this big, you could just feel it like boom, and you could hear it, and you just. We started shaking. I, I feared for my life. I did at that point. So the engine was on fire and there was smore, smoke coming out of it. So uh, I told my wife that the engine was gone and she got up and looked out the window and uh, was a little bit panic stricken. The pilots managed to land safely. Panic and fear turned to relief. All right, this is an example of an airplane uh, failing, right? The engine actually uh, exploded in some sense. And the reason for that is uh, one of the fan blades uh, suffered from metal fatigue. So that actually has something to do with the climate of a chaotic dynamical system. Why? Because we have been using a lot of uh, computational modeling for the fluid mechanics of the engine. Right, for example, for the flow going through the fan blades. And uh, the statistics of such simulations determines how much metal fatigue is experienced by these fan blades over time. Right, this is a really long time scale accumulation of uh, small cracks growing, accumulated over time to cause this kind of uh, uh, structural failure. And if we cannot predict the statistics of the fluid dynamics accurately. We cannot uh, predict the um, accumulated damage of uh, the metal blades. So we have been actually using a lot of this chaotic simulation to make all kinds of uh, engineering decisions. So this is a simulation I performed a few years ago to determine a different type of uh, engine failure. That is uh, uh, engine failure due to the heat flux due to really melting of turbine blades trailing edge. In this case, uh, the statistics of uh, uh, the fluid dynamics refers to the amount of uh, heat transfer into these engine blades. And as you can see, the simulation is quite chaotic. And uh, if we cannot predict the statistics correctly, we cannot predict the accumulated uh, heat damage into the turbine blades. Uh, accurately. So the question is really important in the sense that uh, can the butterfly change the climate? Uh, another way to pose it is that is can small numerical errors, right? Uh, that's uh, analogous to the effect of the wings of a butterfly, right? A small perturbations completely change the climate, which in this case is the statistics of the outcome of the simulation. Right. OK, um, let me pose this question in a much simpler mathematical term, a uh, much more general mathematical term uh, to start with. So let's say we have a computational model and we write it as f of u hat equal to zero. And uh, I use uh, uh, the blue u hat to stand for the numerical solution, right? The u hat is the numerical solution. Now we also have the real world. So let's imagine U, the green U, is the true solution, what actually happens in the real world. So if you plug the real world into your computational model F, most likely it is not going to be equal to zero. The equation won't be satisfied exactly, right? Because there is always a modeling error. And we write the modeling error as F tilde. So F tilde is the modeling error. OK, that's how a real, I mean, what's, uh, if you plug the real world into the equation, what is the residual, right? Now, what we care about is actually not the modeling error. What we care about is the difference between the numerical solution you had and the, the real world you. So the solution error, u minus u hat, is what we care about. In traditional computational engineering or numerical analysis, 
you can always approximate right the difference between the two solution and numerical solution as the inverse right of dfdu or the jacobian of your numerical model times the f tilde the modeling error right this of course requires uh, you to linearize the uh, model and uh, basically a first order taylor series expansion but what you end up getting is that uh, the model stability can be inferred by the magnitude or the operator norm of the inverse of dfdu right so if you have a good handle of that the norm of the inverse of the matrix you have a very good uh, uh, at least a qualitative sense of how much the solution error is if you have a good control of your modeling error so uh, any a very uh, elementary example of this is actually in our uh, finite difference approximation right so we know that if you want to approximate the derivative of a, of a function you can use a central difference right as we can use a central uh, we can use a central difference here and we can use for example a downwind a biased right a down uh, let's say a upwind a upwind difference here uh, which is more accurate well if you have uh, learned the basic uh, numerical analysis you know the central difference is second order and in most cases it's more accurate however this accuracy only has to do with the modeling error it has nothing to do well in order for you to go to solution error there is also a model stability for example if we just solve a pure advection equation right and you use the central difference leads to a less stable scheme and as a result if you look at the solution error of a central difference scheme versus an upwinding scheme the solution error is comparable Right uh, in the uh, central difference scheme, you get a lot of oscillations because the scheme is marginally stable, while uh, upwinding scheme is stable. So despite uh, having more modeling error, you are obtaining comparable solution error. Right. So this highlights the importance of this uh, model stability. So this is very classical example, and a more modern example uh, has to do with uh, turbulence modeling and the machine learning. So that's something uh, in the paper uh, I published with collaborators two years ago. If you take a very accurate uh, direct numerical simulation of a, a turbulent flow, a turbulent channel, and you learn what is the renal stress, right, from the DNS simulation, okay? And then you plug the renal stress into a Reynolds averaged type of uh, uh, modeling equation. You obtain the averaged, uh, the time averaged or, or ensemble averaged velocity. And what you see is that uh, the solution, right? Uh, you can see the solution here of the Reynolds equation with actually the learned, uh, with the learned renal stress is very different from the DNS result. Right? That was a big puzzle to us in the beginning. However, we found out that if instead of learning the renal stress, instead we learn the turbulent viscosity, nu t, right? Although we learn this from the same data, and if you look at the equations, the modeling error is exactly the same between these two equations. However, if you solve the second equation, you get a much more accurate result. So the blue line is from the uh, second equation, the red line is from the first equation, right? So having uh, exactly the same modeling error, but uh, posing it into an equation that is more stable, you get a much better result. So again, this uh, highlights the importance of uh, uh, the modeling stability. So what we learned from this is that, okay, uh, we have computational model and the real world, right? So uh, the, the modeling error and the solution error are related by the inverse of uh, uh, the Jacobian. And uh, this is very important. Model stability is as crucial as an accurate model. So this is all known stuff. What I want to talk about today is how can we generalize this concept if the computational model is not an algebraic model, but a dynamical system, and in particular, 
a chaotic dynamical system, right? We have been using more and more high fidelity models, uh, especially for fluid mechanics. And the, how can we generalize the notion of model stability from the classical steady state computation to unsteady uh, high fidelity modeling? In this case, our computational model is a differential equation, right? Again, we use U hat to denote the numerical solution. And the real world, of course, has a different uh, uh, solution. Let's call it U. So if you plug the real world flow solution into the computational model, we get a residual. Again, we call this F tilde. So F tilde here, again, is the modeling error. Now, if the simulation is indeed chaotic, it does not make any sense to compare the solution error directly, right? Because we know under a small perturbation, a chaotic simulation would become dramatically different after a while. So comparing the solution directly with real world, like a snapshot by snapshot, you never get an agreement. Instead, what we are looking for in the solution error is the error in statistics. Right, again, the definition of the statistics uh, is the limit of time goes to infinity of the time average of a certain function of the state, we call J. All right, so the solution error is the difference between the same statistics computed over the real world solution and the statistics computed with the computational model solution. Now we know the model stability is crucial, but what is the relationship between the modeling error, which we can well control and design our computational model for, and the solution error, which we really care about. What is the relationship between them? That is really uh, what drives the content of this talk today. All right. And the question I'm asking today is really, uh, can a butterfly control the climate, right? Uh, uh, and the, the, it is the same question as are chaotic computational models statistically stable? That is, uh, is, there a, is there a finite relationship, right? Can you bound the solution error if you can bound the modeling error, right? If you think about uh, the, uh, this question mark as an operator that takes a modeling error and gives you a statistical error of the solution, right? Is there a bound on this operator or there is no bound? If there is no bound, then even a tiny modeling error can cause large difference in the solution error, right? Then the question, the answer to the question would be yes. Can a butterfly actually can change or control the climate? And the chaotic computational models are not statistically stable. If there is a bound, right, then, if you give me a magnitude of the modeling error, I know my solution error in the statistics won't be too large. And then uh, that means a butterfly actually cannot control the climate and the chaotic models are statistically stable. Okay, so now answers to the question, right? Uh, so the first uh, answer to this question, uh, let me see, yeah, is, is no, right? And uh, there is a classical uh, trend of argument based on egodicity and shadowing. I'm going to first explain why that is the case. But today I'm going to talk about uh, that uh, this argument doesn't hold water. Actually, there is an answer that is based on, well, uh, some, something I have been playing with uh, for the past year or so. I'm going to talk about the curse on shadowing, right? Uh, I'm going to explain why that is the case uh, and why do I call it the curse on shadowing? Because there is really something that looks like a curse that makes something that is statistically almost impossible, right? With probability zero. Actually, once you do shadowing, it becomes probability one. And then I'll show you evidence in a model system that uh, a small perturbation can actually change statistics dramatically. And finally, I'm going to give a very few, almost a preview of how a butterfly can control the climate or how can you design small perturbations that change the statistics. All right, first, I'm going to uh, explain the traditional classical argument 
about the statistical stability of chaotic simulations. That is under sufficient assumptions, okay? A simulation could reproduce the statistics of a real world dynamical system. Why is that? So in order to explain that, I have to explain the concept of shadowing and egodicity, right? Uh, since this may not be familiar to everybody. So first of all, the concept of shadowing. To explain the concept of shadowing, I need to first explain uh, the typical butterfly effect of a chaotic system. So if you have two dynamical systems, one slightly perturbed from another, right? So it's as if uh, you have these two models, right? One, uh, one with a dynamical system that has a perturbation, another one, a dynamical system without the perturbation F tilde. So basically two dynamical systems that are very similar to each other. Now, if you look at the two dynamical systems, for example, this is an example with a green one and a blue one. Both are uh, iterated maps, right? That operates uh, uh, in the one dimensional interval. So if you start from the same initial condition, this is the initial condition, and you trace a blue trajectory and the green trajectory, according to these two slightly different maps, two slightly different dynamical systems, you're gonna find out that the blue and green trajectory, they become further and further apart as the evolution goes on. This is the hallmark of a chaotic system, right? And in this case, uh, this map is called the tent map, right? The derivative of the tent map always have a magnitude of two. As a result, a small difference would always multiply, right? By a factor of two after every iteration. Therefore, two, uh, starting from the same initial condition, because of the tiny difference in the dynamical system, the difference in the tra trajectory would uh, just uh, keep growing until it reaches order one. However, there exist uh, the so-called shadowing solutions. So if instead of uh, starting from exactly the same initial condition, you start from slightly different initial conditions like the blue one and red one, okay? You can actually, uh, the two solutions can stay together for as long as you want. In this case, you can analytically construct it because the green map the green uh, map is just a scaled version of the blue map. So you can just uh, scale a trajectory that satisfies the blue map proportionally, right? Uh, slightly to get a corresponding solution of a, uh, according to the green equation. And uh, under uh, nice conditions, you can always prove that uh, such red trajectories exist. So this is a more general, um, description of the shadowing lemma, right? I mean, I'm writing it in differential equation form, but uh, it also applies for maps. So basically, if you have a, a equation, if you have a solution u hat that satisfies due dt equal to f of u hat, then for any small epsilon, you can always find a delta such that as long as the magnitude of the perturbation is less than delta, you can always find this U tilde, so-called the shadowing solution, like the red trajectory I showed in this example, that satisfies the perturbed equation. And that the difference between the shadowing solution that satisfies the perturbed equation and the blue solution that satisfies the original equation, the difference is less than that epsilon, which is as small as you want, right? In this case, you can really bond the solution error if your perturbation is small enough, all right? So this is, uh, 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 of course I wrote it in differential equation form, but this is actually a differential equation. This is the Lorenz equation. And if you start from the same initial condition and you impose different magnitude of the perturbation F tilde, uh, you get a solution as you can see from the left-hand side, a solution that diverges exponentially as you increase in time the different colors represent different magnitude of the perturbation. On the other hand, if you look for the shadowing solutions on the right-hand side, right, again, the same set of colors represent the same set of parameters as you see on the left-hand side. However, uh, the solution, uh, they evolve according to different equations. They stay together for actually a very long amount of time. 
right? In this case, uh, because uh, we actually no longer have the uniformly hyperbolic uh, assumptions, so they will not stay together for indefinitely long time, but they can stay together for actually a very, very long amount of time. So, so you can prove different versions of shadow in Lambda given different uh, assumptions, and you have different norms, and they can stay together for different lengths of time. All right. So this gives uh, an almost complete answer to the question, can a butterfly change the climate? If, you, uh, if the assumptions of shadowing apply, then the two different dynamical systems uh, having, an app, having a delta small perturbation means that there exists the shadowing solution, satisfies the perturbed equation. And the difference between the shadowing solution and the unperturbed solution is less than epsilon. And therefore, the statistics of the, uh, of the uh, blue solution and the shadowing solution are going to be epsilon close. Right? So that's uh, basically the result of the shadowing lemma. However, it still doesn't say what about the statistics? I mean, what, what we are interested in is the statistics of the blue solution and green solution, right? We have known that, okay, there is a red solution that satisfies the same equation as the green equation. That is, has statistics close to the blue equation. But does the red solution and the green solution, which satisfy the same equation, do they have the same statistics? Well, the answer, is ergodicity, right? Ergodicity is another very important concept in uh, chaotic dynamical systems. Actually, on the pr pretty surprisingly weak conditions, you can prove that uh, for a solution starting from almost any initial condition, the time average of a function of the solution, which is, which is what I define as a statistics, is equal to the average over a large ensemble if the ensemble has evolved to a steady state. Right, so ergodicity says that, okay, uh, if you have two solutions that satisfies the same equation, the green U and the red shadowing solution U tilde, then because of ergodicity, the statistics of U uh, are gonna be identical to that of U tilde, right? And because the statistics of U tilde is epsilon close to that of U hat, the statistics of the green U is also going to be epsilon close to the statistics of U hat. So this gives a no answer to the question, can the butterfly change the climate? Because if you have a butterfly, that means your perturbation F tilde is going to be very, very small. And as a result, the difference in statistics between the green and blue solution is going to be very, very small. Right? Any questions so far about uh, this uh, classical answer to the question? No? Okay, so I've actually relied uh, this combination a lot in uh, uh, my, uh, the, the last few years and uh, published a bunch of papers uh, on shadowing sensitivity analysis. Basically it combined these concepts to compute uh, sensitivities of statistics uh, with respect to perturbations to the dynamical system. However, what I found over the last few years is that uh, these actually uh, mostly are incorrect. In the sense, there is a very uh, tricky curse on shadowing. And let me explain why that is the case, why it actually invalidates the answer we just uh, went through. Okay. Uh, the the curse or the problem lies in the second part in the ergodicity. And uh, the, the second part says that the statistics of U, the green U and the shadow in solution U tilde are identical, right? And that is because of ergodicity. However, if you look at the rigorous statement of ergodicity, it says that for a solution starting from almost any initial condition, the time average is the same. So we are missing this almost word. So I mean, the more rigorous statement is that the statistics of the green solution U are almost surely identical to those of U hat, uh, U tilde, right? Which satisfies the same green equation, same perturbed equation. So 
the almost surely seems to indicate that unless we are extremely unlucky, right, unless we are cursed, I mean, the, the green and red solution should have the same statistics. However, what we are missing here is that the red solution utility, the shadowing solution is not just any solution. It's a solution that we know exists, but is not randomly chosen. So the question becomes the following, is there a curse on shadowing, right? Is there uh, something that tells me that if I compute the shadowing solution, the shadowing solution is not a randomly chosen solution. It has to be specifically computed, right? Because there is only a statement that it exists, right? It's not randomly chosen. So is it possible that as soon as I start to obtain shadowing solutions, the shadowing solution becomes one of these almost never chosen solutions if you choose randomly? And as a result, the statistics of this kind of uh, utility, the shadowing solutions are gonna be different from the statistics of the physical world, the U. And uh, as a result, invalidates the whole argument. So let's examine if a shadowing solution belongs to the almost all solutions or it belongs to these uh, measure zero set of solutions that is predicted by egotic theory that does not agree in statistics with almost all other solutions. Again, let's start by looking at one of the simplest example of chaotic dynamical system, this uh, tent map, right? It's actually a pretty general, it belongs to a pretty general set of uh, chaotic systems uh, called the uh, piecewise uh, expanding maps. So we have two pieces, both pieces are expanding, right? One goes from zero to two, the other goes from two back to zero. So if you look at the statistics of a typical solution or almost any solution, you should be able to find out that the density or the probability density of almost all solutions it's a uniform distribution between the range of the uh, uh, map, zero to two, right? Or uniform uh, distribution. This is because, I mean, this is actually pretty easy to prove in the sense if you, if you take a uniform distribution, you map it, right? You're going to the left-hand side, right? Of this uh, uniform distribution is going to map into a uniform distribution from zero to two. The right-hand side of the uniform distribution is also going to map according to the downward slope into another uniform distribution from zero to two. So you superimpose that and you again get a uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution is stationary. You can also prove uh, this is a stable fixed point. It's, it's contracting, right? So, so basically it is, uh, uh, if you start from any uh, distribution that is absolutely continuous to Lebesgue measure, you are going to converge to this uh, uh, uniform distribution. Okay, so now let's take this map and try to perturb it and then construct shadowing solutions of the perturbed solutions. This is the way we're going to perturb it. So instead of having the tip right at uh, uh, x equal to one, we move the tip towards the right a little bit by epsilon. So the tip now is located at one plus epsilon. Now you ask, okay, what is the uh, statistics of almost any perturbed solution? Well, it is still uniform because, okay, if you take a uniform and uh, uh, you map uh, the uniform distribution on the left, right, uh, basically over here, uh, towards the zero to two interval, you get a uniform distribution. And on the right, you also map it, uh, you get a uniform distribution, you superimpose it, you are uniform again, right? So, so uh, even the perturbed solutions has uniform distribution. Now let's take one of these perturbed solutions. Let's call it uh, U hat, right? U hat is the a perturbed solution and let's try to compute a shadowing solution to this U hat. Now here's the prop proposition. If you take a U hat and you define this variable X tilde I zero as whether the ith iterate of 
the solution of the perturbed solution is less than one plus epsilon, or does it lie on the left of this tip or on the right of the tip? Okay, and then you further define a bunch of uh, uh, zero one variables with the index k plus one with basically a positive index by it would, by recursively applying the uh, exclusive all operator. And then you construct the real numbers by basically treating these uh, x tilde's, these zero one variables as the bits or binary digits of this x tilde. Okay, you can prove that uh, my x tilde actually satisfies the original equation. So this is the original tent map with a a uh, slope of two with the tip at equal to one. So this actually satisfies the original uh, equation, the unperturbed equation, okay? Instead of uh, the x hat, which satisfies the perturbed equation. And the difference between x tilde and x hat is going to be less than epsilon for eternity. So x tilde is a shadowing solution. Right, x tilde satisfies the original unperturbed equation and it is close to the perturbed solution. However, what you're gonna see is that if you plot the statistical distribution of such x tildes, you get this. So this is for a very tiny epsilon, right? I'm only moving the tip a little bit and obtain a typical solution of the perturbed uh, map. And then I tried to compute the shadowing solution according to the last slide that satisfies the original unperturbed equation that shadows the perturbed solution. The distribution is obviously non-uniform. Why is that? So let's look into this a little bit more. So we, we see that the shadowing solution have remarkably different statistics compared to almost all solutions. So why is the shadowing solution not, does not belong to this probability one set of solutions? If you look at almost any solution, right, starting from almost any initial condition, and if you represent uh, either an initial condition or any of the solutions as a, a binary uh, number, right, uh, look at its bits. Right, so we know uh, the number is between zero and two. So, so k starts from zero, the k equal to zero is the integer bit and k equal to one is the first the bit after the, that, that's, uh, after the point and uh, the k, uh, basically the kth bit after the point. Then you can show that, okay, the iteration, right, goes, that goes from i to i plus one can be represented in this uh, binary uh, logical format. So basically this equation and this equation is equivalent. And furthermore, almost all real numbers, if you write it into bits, the bits are actually independent Bernoulli half random variables. Right, I mean, this, uh, uh, this is a property called the normal, right? So almost all real numbers are normal. So basically, if you write it down into either binary or decimal or whatever for forms, I mean, the, the digits are RID, random variables. Well, this actually guarantees, this is one of the ways to actually prove that uh, uh, the distribution is actually uh, uniform like if you keep iterating the map. However, if you look at the shadowing solution, right? The shadowing solution is also represented into this uh, binary format. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, the definition of this shadowing solution from here actually leads to dependent bits. It leads to a particular type of dependent bits in the sense that the next bit, right, in the, in the binary re representing, representation has slightly higher than 50% probability of repeating the previous bit. So if a bit is one, the next bit is also slightly higher likely to be one. If the bit is zero, then the next bit is uh, slightly more likely to be zero than to be one. All right, so, so this leads to dependent bits. Of course, these kind of uh, numbers, I mean, if you look at the all uh, real numbers, the set of numbers whose bits 
are having a, a larger likelihood of repeating the previous bits is actually a measure zero set, right? However, if you do shadowing, you are guaranteed to land in a solution whose numbers, whose solution are such numbers. Okay, so, so this is a, actually an equivalent way of constructing this kind of a probability, this kind of a fractal probability distributions. If you choose all the numbers, if you choose a set of numbers whose number, uh, whose bits are 51% probability of repeating the previous bit, you get a distribution like this, exactly the same as the shadowing solution we looked at previously. If you increase the uh, probability to 55%, you get an even more hairier solution. All right, so this is really one counter example of saying that, okay, if you do shadowing, you are not guaranteed to landing this almost all set of solutions, this probability one set of solutions whose statistics agrees with almost all other solutions. All right, any questions so far? Okay, so how about other shadowing solutions? I'm basically looking at one specific type of perturbation of one specific dynamical system, right? So if you take the same dynamical system and uh, perturb it in a different way, right? So if you, for example, instead of uh, moving the tip towards the right, you can move the tip down. And uh, after you move the tip down, you look at uh, the, of distribution of almost all solutions, it looks like this. However, if you look at the, the distribution of the shadowing solutions, it looks like this. So completely different, all right? And again, we have this uh, fractal pattern coming out of the sh uh, uh, distribution of the shadowing solutions. Now, if you pinch the tent map instead of uh, shifting the point, uh, you get a physical distribution like this, a distribution of almost all solutions. However, if you look at the corresponding shadowing solution, it looks like this, right? Again, completely different from the physical solution and uh, gross hairs like fractal. Now look at the different map. So this is the Lorentz map. This map is extracted from the Lorentz equation, the ordinary differential equation that describes the convection, a uh, heat-driven convection of an atmospheric cell. Okay, so here we are perturbing three parameters. The, there are three parameters in the Lorentz equation and thus three parameters in, in the Lorentz map. So if we perturb the sigma from 10 to 15, you get a physical density like this and a shadowing density like this, right? The physical density looks smooth, the shadowing density looks fractal. If you perturb rho, right? Physical density looks like this, shadowing density looks like this. If you put a beta, physical density looks like this, shadow density looks like this. So we always seems to be getting a non-physical, I mean, by physical, I mean uh, a solution whose statistics agrees with almost uh, all other solutions. So shadowing solutions does not seem to be uh, lying in the set of uh, physical solutions, although the set of physical solutions are probability one. All right, so by doing the simple fact of doing shadowing seems to be pushing your shadowing solution into a measure zero set of solutions whose statistics are different from almost all other solutions. What's the consequence? The consequence is again, if you look at our argument for can a butterfly or can a small perturbation change the statistics? The shadowing argument, the first part is still correct. However, the second part is not, right? The statistics of the solution you care about may not be identical, or in the cases we have looked at, is definitely not identical to those of the shadowing solution that we know exist and satisfies the same solution as the physical solution we care about. So although we know the statistic of the, of the shadowing solution is absolutely close to the statistics of the uh, numerical solution you had, we have no way of knowing if the statistics of the real solution U is close to the statistics of the numerical solution you had or not. 
So this is what I call the curse of shadowing, right? Because uh, uh, the special thing, there's something special about shadowing that uh, makes your utilda, the shadowing solution, not agreeing with almost all other solution that satisfies the same equation. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now last, uh, let's look at, uh, uh, so basically up to now we have said that, okay, uh, a butterfly, the answer, the previous, the classical answer that a butterfly cannot change the climate does not hold water, right? But it, we still haven't uh, seen any example that uh, a butterfly can change the climate or a arbitrarily small perturbation can actually lead to non-negligible change in the statistics of a system. So we went on and deliberately constructed such a counterexample. So here's graphically how it works, right? You take the same tent map, a map that goes from uh, zero, right? To zero, zero to one, two, back to two, zero. And if you perturb it in this, well, multi-segmented way, so this is six segments, right? You, of course, you can get a change in the statistical distribution, right? So instead of a uniform 0.5, uh, you get now get a distribution like this. In particular, if you look at the distribution, I have shifted the mean of my solution from 0.5, which is, I mean, from one, right? Which is uh, the mean of a uniform zero to random variable towards more than one, right? I have increased the mean of the solution if you just look at the distribution. Now, the question is, can I construct smaller perturbations that have equivalent shift to the mean of the distribution? The answer is yes. Now, if I look at how I change the perturbation on my left-hand side. So instead of a large magnitude perturbation like this, now I am making a much smaller magnitude perturbation like this. The difference is that the magnitude has decreased, but the number of segments has increased or the derivative of the perturbation actually stayed the same. Now, as a result, this is the uh, resulting change in the statistical distribution. And uh, uh, you can prove that uh, the shift in the mean is exactly the same as before in this case. Okay, what if I further increase the number of segments of my perturbation and further decrease the magnitude, I get this. And in this case, you can't even see the perturbation. It's too small to see, right? Uh, maybe you can see a little bit, uh, like the line is a little bit weakly. But the magnitude of the perturbation is tiny. And the resulting shift in the distribution, if you, if you look at it, the right-hand side is a lot heavier, right? It's significantly visibly heavier than the left-hand side. And the resulting change in the mean is exactly the same as in the previous two cases. So we have shown an example where really the operator norm that, okay, uh, the, the, the norm of the operator that takes a perturbation delta F tilde and gives you the change in the statistics, in this case, the mean, that operator is an unbounded. It doesn't have a a finite norm, right? You can construct an arbitrarily small delta f that gives you the same change in the statistics. So that's our counter example that, uh, okay, uh, actually a small perturbation, a butterfly can change the climate. Well, okay, any questions so far? Okay, so, so I, I think I have several minutes left and uh, what I'm going to show you is, uh, uh, some I, I don't have time to uh, go over the math uh, in the next few slides, but uh, uh, I'm going to show you, I think, three papers uh, uh, we have written in the last year that shows not just the, a butterfly can change the climate, but uh, how can a butterfly control the climate or how can it change the climate? So that is uh, basically how do we compute the derivative of a statistics uh, given a perturbation, right? So if we can compute such derivatives, and in particular, if we can compute such derivative using an adjoint-like method, 
which is really computing the derivative for all possible perturbations, right? Then it tells us exactly how could a butterfly control the climate or how should I design the perturbations to the dynamical system that achieves a maximal effect on the statistics I care about. Well, that algorithm uh, is called, uh, we call it the S3 algorithm. And the reason it's called S3 is called, it's called the split space sensitivity algorithm. It really splits, uh, splits the phase space into stable directions uh, and unstable directions in a very particular way. It's, it's not actually the same as the traditional split uh, into uh, like according to, for example, the uh, Lyapunov subspaces. It's a little bit more tricky than that. But uh, after this is done, you can really compute the sensitivities by just following a single trajectory, making it very easy to apply to uh, simulations. So this is a, 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 the simplest example of applying the S3 algorithm to a one dimensional map. In this case, uh, there is actually no splitting because the entire space is unstable, right? So, and you can show that, okay, uh, basically the algorithm also converges like a Monte Carlo method in, in the sense as you increase the trajectory length, the error in the sensitivity computed decreases uh, like one over square root of the length of the simulation. Right, but uh, basically, but the constant, right? If you compare it with finite difference, it's much, much, much faster. And uh, it is possible to do the adjoint version of this algorithm. And uh, we have also expanded into multiple dimensions. Uh, for example, this is our modified version of the so-called Baker's map, right? So it's, it has two dimensions, one dimension unstable, the other dimension stable. And we deliberately, uh, perturbed it such that uh, the unstable directions are not straight lines, right? So, so if you look at the filaments, right, this kind of a curvy filaments are actually the unstable directions. The directions uh, somewhere um, uh, transverse to these filaments are stable directions. So we applied our algorithm to these cases and uh, showed uh, how it works. And one of the uh, very interesting byproducts of this uh, algorithm is uh, uh, the so-called uh, gradients of the density along these unstable filaments, along these uh, unstable directions. So, so let me show you what it means uh, uh, by looking at the Lorenz equation, uh, a differential equation. So if you look at the density on the attractor, right? This is actually a projected density, but uh, you can use the same algorithm to compute the density on the uh, attractor itself. So if you look at the projected density, right? And the particular, the logarithm of the projected density looks like this, like along the rims, uh, it's really, really low density. And uh, in the middle, it's higher density, right? And the S3 algorithm actually computes as one of the byproduct a, derivative or the gradient of the density relative to itself or a percentage gradient, right? So basically as you move along X or Z directions, uh, how the rate of change in the density relative to the density itself. So uh, D rho DX over rho or D rho, D, uh, or D, D rho DZ over rho. This is actually quite interesting. Uh, by the way, this can be actually scaled to arbitrary dimensions, uh, no matter how many unstable manifolds, uh, unstable directions you have or stable directions you have, uh, the same algorithm actually computes the gradients. But this actually has very interesting consequences. Um, another question is that, do the statistics actually respond smoothly to parameters? Okay, uh, in all the previous questions, we kind of assumed that uh, this derivative, right, uh, the derivative of the statistics actually exists uh, as you change the parameters. But there are evidences in, in even very simple dynamical systems that such derivative does not have to exist. And we constructed uh, this map, uh, we call it uh, the owning map, just because uh, for small gammas, it looks like uh, the dome of an owning. But, uh, 
if you look at uh, the gamma parameter that controls basically how sharp this tip is, uh, for smaller gamma, the tip is sharp. For large gamma, the tip is not sharp. And if you look at the statistics, actually in this case, just the average of the solution as a function of gamma, you can see that when gamma is small, it's very smooth. And as gamma is large, it becomes non-smooth and uh, doesn't seem to be differentiable at all. And it turns out that the statistics of the byproduct of the S3 algorithm or the relative density, right? D, D rho dx over rho, if you plot the histogram of this quantity in the logarithmic scale, right? This is logarithmic scale. The slope of the tail, right? I mean, it seems to be, uh, seems to be often a power law tail. And uh, the exponent of the power law tells you if the system is expected with differentiable or not. I mean, just to look at the, the quantity, the quantity actually does not correspond to any particular statistic or any particular perturbation. It just has to do with the dynamical system itself at that single uh, parameter value. And the statistics of that quantity tells you if you make some perturbation and look at some statistics, do you expect the statistics to be differentiable to that parameter or not, right? This is actually a very interesting discovery uh, that uh, we, uh, we recently had. So to conclude, uh, uh, I think it's gonna be a very, it's, it's a very interesting question and we don't really have definite answers, right? We, we have answers, uh, we have some answers to this question for very simple dynamical systems. Right, uh, we have very good answers for one dimensional maps. We have some answers for uh, multiple dimensional maps and uh, well, we have some good answers for, for, for maps and differential equation with a single unstable direction. And we don't have that much of a good answer uh, to general systems, especially systems that doesn't uh, satisfy the assumptions like uh, uniform hyperbolicity. So it's gonna be a very interesting question. Uh, to further study, can small perturbations completely change statistics? Or what kind of uh, statistics could be completely changed by small perturbations? Or what kind of small perturbations can completely change statistics? But the overall conclusion is that uh, model stability is actually crucial, right? Uh, is as crucial for solution accuracy as the accuracy of the model itself. And shadowing, actually provides no stability for statistics in chaotic systems because of the curse of shadowing, right? It cannot guarantee at all, right? Uh, uh, no matter if you have uniform hyperbolicity or whatever assumptions you need for, for, for the most, uh, uh, rig uh, most uh, strong statement of uh, shadowing, it doesn't uh, matter. Uh, it provides no stability for statistical stability. And we, we do have evidence, right? Uh, even for this uh, tent map, which satisfies uh, pretty much any uh, assumptions you want to ask uh, that uh, arbitrary small perturbations can change statistics. And uh, uh, we have uh, developed uh, this S3 algorithm that uh, computes sensitivity of uh, statistics. And, uh, uh, and one of the byproduct, which is uh, quite, uh, uh, a fortunate uh, that uh, seems to be a very good indicator, a, a computationally um, obtainable indicator of uh, whether a statistics is expected, actually any statistics is expected to be differentiable with respect to any type of perturbations. And, and these are some references if you are interested in uh, looking further or discuss further. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to answer any questions you have. All right, thanks Chi Chi for that very nice talk. It's it's nice to hear that story because I've been I've been uh, you know listening to your talks from quite some while back, uh, you know, and hearing all that story about shadowing coming to that kind of a dramatic conclusion is actually quite nice. So um, if there is any questions from the audience, please uh, please uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask. And while you're doing this, maybe I can squeeze in. Uh, a question myself. Um, 
you, you mentioned that there is a curse of shadowing, but I, I was wondering whether uh, shadowing can somehow be rescued or, or salvaged by, uh, by regularizing it, by imposing constraints, for example, uh, kulbach leibler distance or, or something like this, uh, for, uh, for saving or staying close to a specific uh, distribution. Is this a chance at all or is all hope lost? That's a very interesting question. Uh, and I don't know the answer in general, but uh, I, I, can, I can provide an answer to the question in the most uh, idealized condition. That is uh, when, you have, when you do have uniform hyperbolicity, mm -hmm. right? You can actually prove that uh, uh, shadowing solutions are unique. So let me go back to the statement. Right. Uh, so, so this, if you do have uniform hyperbolicity and, uh, uh, and you also define these norms, right? Both this norm and this norm as L infinity norm over infinite time, right? So, so mm -hmm. basically you can define a Banach space uh, with the norm being the supremum of uh, a norm over all time, going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then the, uh, the shadow solution utilda is actually unique. Right, there is no second uh, or third uh, shadowing solution that shadows uh, this uh, numerical solution for indefinite time. So uh, there is no kind of uh, a way to impose any uh, regularization in the sense that the, the shadowing solution is already unique. So for, for weaker conditions, uh, then I, I think uh, there might be more uh, leeway, okay. right, to, to impose a, a regularization and additional constraints yeah. because uh, so, yeah. so, so in a more general case, I, I yeah. don't know the solution uh, to the question. Yeah. yeah, it's true that you first need a degree of freedom before you nail that degree of freedom down with an additional exactly. constraint, I agree. Exactly, yeah. right, right. Good, good. I see a hand from Shusong. Shusong, please unmute yourself and, and fire away. Okay, okay, Chi Chi. Okay, thank you for the very nice talk. Can you hear me? How I mute yes. myself? Yes, yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, so, so you you have this model error. Uh, is, okay, th this is a very simple question. So, what is counted as a error in the model? You you show examples where you change the um, map shape. You change some parameters maybe in a broader context. So you can change the parameters. Maybe you have removed certain terms from differential equation or in, in partial differential equations and you, 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 you have boundary conditions and they change, it, change, it, change the boundary conditions a bit. Are, are all these counted as uh, model errors or, or not? Yeah, the model error basically include the anything that uh, uh, comes out of uh, uh, the equation when you plug in a real solution into your computational model, right? So, so for example, if you, the boundary condition but then, is- well, If I don't have real, so, so this is defined, um, then you don't, how can you, you, so you don't know beforehand what's your model before you know the real solution, then you don't know the uh, the error in the model. That, is that the implication? Uh, yes. Usually, you have, in order to implement, your, in order to understand the model in error, you need a at least a higher fidelity solution, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, for example, one way to ob obtain the model in error is that you have a either higher fidelity solution or data coming from experiments, and you plug it into your computational model to see. Uh, how well they are satisfied, right? That's one way to assess the modeling error. And uh, a different way is if you do have analytical equations that describes the real world, uh, like Navier-Stokes equation, but you can't solve it, right? So you have to simplify it to a computational model that under yeah. it. And then from the equations, you can actually derive uh, uh, what the modeling error is. So, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, in, in both ways, you have to either have a solution of the real world or have governing equations for the real world. 
and then compare how different uh, uh, these are from your computational model. Okay, so yeah, okay, this um, yeah, a little bit different from what I I thought. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so you are saying okay, so this shadowing can go wrong. We give examples, so you mean okay the the probability of shadowing not doing what is supposed to be doing is not a probability zero, right? So is it a probability one then? So what's well, the probability of shadowing going wrong? I, again, I have no answer in general, but uh, for these specific cases, the probability is one, right? So, so for example, in this case, when I'm looking for a shadowing solution of a perturbed equation where the perturbation is shifting the tip towards the right, right? Yeah, yeah. Then I can prove that if I take almost any solution of the perturbed equation, okay? Mm. And I compute the corresponding shadowing equation of that almost any perturbed solution, then the shadowing solution with uh, probability one. I mean, so yeah, the shadowing solution basically with probability one is not going to agree with the statistics of the uh, almost any solutions of the non perturbed equation. But but in general, I don't know because there there are infinitely many uh, perturbed equations, right? Yeah, you exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, but if you kind of from structure point of view, so you there. If they the, there are some sort of critical perturbation where you know you 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 the behavior will be very different, but for most of the parameters, most of this uh, type of this distortions or, or or the model errors, uh, uh, you are not that unlucky. <laughs> so, so yeah, anyway. that, that that is a, a question I don't know. So so let, I can only give you my experience. So, so my experience is that uh, uh, in this case, right, uh, where the we have one-dimensional unstable maps, yeah. anything I have tried, uh, like any type of perturbations I tried, leads to unphysical shadow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, back to the Lorentz, yeah. Uh, yeah, anything I tried leads to uh, unphysical uh, solutions. However. If you have a multi-dimensional dynamical system with stable and unstable directions or components uh, uh, a lot lower than the dimension of the uh, phase space, then we were able to find the perturbations for which the shadowing solution are actually physical. And mm. these tend to be the perturbations in the stable directions. So, so basically, I uh, I think uh, I I haven't uh, uh, I haven't uh, proved this yet, but it seems to be that uh, you can, if the perturbation has an effect of basically moving the attractor from one place to another place yeah, in the yeah, yeah yeah we we get physical uh, solutions physical shadowing solutions, but if the effect of the perturbation is not moving the attractor but just the shifting the distribution inside of the existing attractor, then mm -hmm. That intends to get uh, non-physical solutions. Uh, okay. I, I think that it'll be quite uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I can kind of imagine the kind of rationale. But on the other hand, okay, you mentioned